standing near the shore of this northern extremity of the Red Sea, I saw before me an immense sandy valley, which, without the aid of geological science, to the eye of common observation and reason, had once been the bottom of a sea or the bed of a river. The valley varied from four to eight miles in breadth, and on each side were high, dark, and barren mountains, bounding it like a wall. On the left were the mountains of Judea, and on the right, those of Seir. And among them, buried from the eyes of strangers, the approach to it known only to the wandering Bedouins, was the ancient capital of this kingdom, the partially excavated city of Petra. It lay before me, in barrenness and desolation. No trees grew in the valley, and no verdure on the mountaintops. All was bare, dreary, and desolate. This was the American traveler and archaeologist John Lloyd Stevens, perhaps the first American to reach Petra in 1834, writing in his journals about the desolate ruins of Petra, nowadays located in the country of Jordan. But in antiquity, this was a vibrant place, alive with all the bustle we see in modern day spice markets. People buying and selling goods, warm aromas of exotic spices wafting through the hot desert air. Even the land was not the arid desert we seem to think about today. For fruit trees, orchards and legumes and grains were grown in relative abundance. How did the Arabian desert and the peninsula then become the center of spice trade in the ancient world? Hello, I'm Thomas Dinas, and this is the Delicious Legacy Podcast, an archaeogastronomical podcast where on each episode we go to a different ancient time and examine recipes, ingredients and foods from that era. Today we'll go to the ancient Arabian Peninsula and we'll explore the importance of spices in the ancient uh, Mediterranean Egypt and Mesopotamia, and we'll find out uh, what kick-started this um, incredible spice journey and trade between um, the Mediterranean and the ancient um, Far Eastern lands of Asia. The history of the spice trade is intertwined with the history of the Arabian Peninsula. At first, this seems a little bit odd, and perhaps a little baffling. Why this inhospitable desert is connected with the spice trade so closely? Firstly, surely nothing grows here, right? Well, obviously, this being an episode about the spices, this couldn't be further from the truth. Despite its fame to us, as a hot, desolate place, the vast Arabian Peninsula has many diverse habitats and even fertile plains. At the same time, the obvious water scarcity and the rugged terrain is the reason that what little grows here wild 
it seems to possess concentrated qualities in aromas and essential oils. And it is valued and in most cases revered by the locals, but also by people in far-flung places as well. That is not to say, of course, that the Arabian deserts are home to a huge variety of spices. Compared to the tropics, especially India and places like Indonesia, uh, which have a lot more to offer in terms of fragrant, unique plants, barks and gums. But the people, the tribes that inhabited and traversed the hardened landscapes of what we now call Yemen, Oman and Jordan, among other places, these desert environments were as crucial to the spread of spices from east to west. The inhabitants, with an entrepreneurial spirit, definitely transformed these aromatics into invaluable commodity that had to be used by everyone eventually, in rituals and as food condiment, and commanded in many cases more money than gold and silver. Of course, most commonly today, we think of spices such as cinnamon, mace, cloves, vanilla and nutmeg as part of the vast violent imperial and colonial trade wars in the age of exploration and discovery between European powers such as Portugal, um, England, Spain, the Dutch and France, and of course linked with the slave trade too. And this is correct and fair, of course. But these European merchants and colonists weren't the first to seek the spices and weren't the first to trade them and create monopolies. Thousands of years before, the pioneers of our story, because this is a podcast about ancient foodstuffs primarily, people like the Sabaeans, Nabataeans, were exploring and exploiting the lines that connect sea and sand, east and west, Rome and India, the Red Sea to the Indian Ocean. Firstly, with caravans with camels, then with sails. The precarious and adventurous nature of the spice trade shaped not only the lives of Arabian peoples, but also the fortunate history of Rome, Persia, India and other far-flung corners of the known world. Theirs was an interconnected world, dependent on trade, the seasons and the exchange of goods between the distant Mediterranean lands and the far eastern Moluccas island spices, with intermediaries, the vast coastal Indian cities and empires. One of my favorite texts of the ancient classical world that survived to our day is the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, or in modern English, the circumnavigation of the Red and Arabian Seas, an account or a diary of the captain of a merchant ship dating roughly from the 1st century AD. The captain was a Greek-Egyptian trader living under the wider Roman Empire. His ship embarked to what uh, it seemed a normal, well-established and regular network of communication and trading missions from the Egyptian ports of the Red Sea down to the coast of East Africa, around the Arabian Peninsula and off to India, loaded with goods following the trade path that existed for a few centuries perhaps already. But to me, it always seemed like a fascinating, mysterious and magical adventure where the sailors of um, this merchant vessel almost 1,900 years ago were meeting and interacting with unknown tribes and their alien languages and trading in goods which perhaps were equally alien to them in their own form and surrounded with apocryphal and fantastical stories of origin for these goods. But crucially, this was the cargo that the ship had to transport to India in order to get the precious spices that Roman aristocracy so desperately needed and wanted. We can hear the words of the writer of the Periplus. Sailing along the coast beyond Mosillum, after a two-day's course, you come to the so-called Little Nile River, 
and a fine spring and a small laurel grove and cape elephant. Then the shore recedes into a bay and has a river called Elephant and a large laurel grove called a canai, where alone is produced the far side frankincense in great quantity and of the best grade. Beyond this place, the coast trending toward the south, there is the market and cape of spices, an abrupt promontory at the very end of the Berber coast towards the east. The anchorage is dangerous at times from the groundswell because the place is exposed to the north. A sign of an approaching storm, which is peculiar to the place, is that the deep water becomes more turbid and changes its color. When this happens, they all run to a large promontory called Tabai, which offers safe shelter. There are imported into this market town the things already mentioned, and there are produced in it cinnamon and its different varieties, gizir, asifa, aribo, magala, and moto, and frankincense. Two and a half thousand years ago, as Herodotus and Pliny tells us, caravans laden with spices, aromatics and other precious merchandise made their slow way from southern Arabia in particular to the port of Bereniki in the Egyptian coast, where the valuable produce arrived by sea. It had come from centralized collecting points in India and it was bound for Egypt and the prosperous trading cities of Tyre and Sidon on the Phoenician seaboard. But Egypt too was a considerable naval power. Twenty centuries before our own era, the Egyptians established commercial relations with the mysterious lands of Ophir and Pontus, Somalia and Aden, to acquire spices, rare woods, precious stones and gold too. Today's episode is brought to you with the welcome support of Malbian Creek, UK's leading supplier of premium Greek produce, wine, herbs, cheeses, or olive oil. From all over the wild corners of the country and working directly with small artisanal producers. There are many Greek herbs to enhance your dinner plate. King amongst them is oregano, and Malbian Creek has the best organic oregano from Mount Parnonas in the Arcadia region of the Peloponnese. Ancient Greeks thought oregano made the mountains glow. Hippocrates, an illustrious ancient Greek doctor, was accustomed to choose oregano for the treatment of many diseases. But you can use it in sauces, tomato salads, and on meats on your barbecue. You can also try something a little different. Savory, which is another strong pungent mountain herb, great in salads with olives and oranges, but also delicious with grilled lamb or mutton. Whatever you need, Malbian Greek has you covered. You can shop online and have the exquisite goods delivered to your doorstep across the UK, or you can visit the shop at Art 17, Apollo Business Park, Lucy Way, SC16, 4ET, Bermond in London. Malbian Greek, the one-stop shop for your Greek fix. And for you dear listeners, you can get a serious 15% discount if you go to malbiangreek.com slash delicious and use that to get 15% off your next purchase. Let's get a sense of um, place and geography. The southern coast of Arabia, from Bab el Mandeb to Waz el Had, has a length of about 1,200 miles, divided almost equally in climatic conditions. The western half is largely sandstone bluff, sun scorched and arid, cut, however, by occasional ravines which bring down scanty rains during the monsoon to fertilize a broad strip of coastal plain. On the western edge, the mountains of Yemen rise above 10,000 feet and attract a good rainfall which waters the western slope towards the Red Sea. On the eastern slope, the water courses are soon lost in the sand, but on the upper levels the valleys are protected and fertile. Such were the Nerjan, the Minean Jauf, and the Valley of the Sabaeans, which last was made rich by the great dam that stored its waters for irrigation. And in these three valleys, the centers of caravan trade, bound north toward the Nile and Euphrates, owned their prosperity, mainly to their position above the greatest of all, the east-flowing course, the valley of Hadramaut. This great cleft in the sandstone rock, which gathers the streams from the highest peaks, runs parallel with the coast for more than 200 miles, fertile and productive for nearly the entire distance. 
Then it turns to the south and its waters are lost, the mouth of the valley being desert like the cliffs that line its course. This was one of the best frankincense districts. Beyond the mouth of the Wadi Hadramaut is Was Fartak, nearly north of the Cape Guardafawi. Here the climate changes, the monsoon, no longer checked by the African coast, leaves its effect on the coastal hills, which gradually rise above 4,000 feet, clothed with tropical vegetation, while the coast plains are narrow and broken. The northern slopes of these mountains feed the watercourse now known as Wadi Rekot, about 100 miles long, which empties into the Kuria Moria Bay, beyond which are fertile coastal plains as far as Was El Had. These mountains, the Dofar and the Janaba districts, facing which lie the Kura Maria Islands, were the oldest and perhaps the most productive of the frankincense districts of the Arabia. And thus, it was always the ambition of the various powers of that region to extend their rule so as to include the Dofar Mountains, the Hadramaut Valley and the opposite Somali coast of Africa, thus controlling the production and commanding the price, in short, forming a frankincense trust. The restricted area of the Arabian incense lands, bordered as they were by the steppe and the desert, made them constantly subject to attack and control by different wandering tribes, while at the same time their local conditions of intensive cultivation of a controlled product of great and constant value made of a peculiarly ordered state of society for a development of caste, unusual in Semitic lands, in which the cultivator the warriors and the privileged slave had their place in the order given. The historian George Hurani, more than 50 years ago, he proposed boldly, some would say. Geography favored the development of sailing from the Arabian shores. A very long coastline bounds the peninsula on three sides, stretching from the Gulf of Suez round to the head of the Persian Gulf. Near these coasts lie the most fertile parts of Arabia, Al-Yaman, Hadramaut and Yumun. A connection between them by sea was no more formidable than the crossing of the deserts and mountains which separated them on land. Commerce with the neighboring countries was invited so that across the enclosed waters of the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf, the Arabs might be in contact with two of the most ancient centers of wealth and civilization, Egypt and Iran, not to mention Mesopotamia. Most important of all, the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf, supplemented by the Nile, the Euphrates and the Tigris, are natural channels for through traffic between the Mediterranean Basin and Eastern Asia, the Arabs were astride two of the world's great trade routes. Let's go back to our initial question, why the Arabs, why the Arab tribes became so excellent with handling spices? Gary Paul Naphan says this is a stark and largely unpopulated landscape it's not totally barren yet most of the world's farmers and city dwellers would declare it empty by that they might mean that it is marginally arable barely habitable or incapable of offering much value to humankind today but they are wrong if they presume that this landscape lacks any value to us over millennia, something of exceptional value came out of this arid landscape, when combined with other forces, changed the course of human history. The Dofar Highlands, a plateau that sits some 2,000 feet above the Arabian Sea. It is home to a scatter of semi-nomadic herding and foraging Jabali tribes, known as the people of the Sahri, the ones who make mountain talk. The smell of the country. It reminds us, the ancient Greek geographers, that they call this country Ephdemon Arabia, or Arabia the Blessed, and from that we get the Latin Arabia Felix. At first, it offered nothing more than a few fragrant desert plants and animal substances that they were collectively known to the Greeks as aromaticos, 
Such aromatic substances have long been perceived by many cultures as having the capacity to generate a sense of happiness, healing, well-being and harmony within the world. Why there? The aridity that results from the heat and drought has helped rather than hindered the evolution of aromatic plants, which uh, we define as those having compounds containing benzene rings. Over millennia, the deserts of the Arabian Peninsula developed into prime habitat for the most powerfully aromatic plants in the world. What these desert plants lacked in productivity, they often made up in fragrance, flavor and mythic potency. Arabia Felix could aptly be called the birthplace of the global trade in aromatics. Despite its scarcity of vegetation, Arabia Felix is full of highly pungent scents and flavors. It has wild crocuses akin to saffron, barks reminiscent of cinnamon, wild fennel, leeks, garlic and onions, aromatic gums and raisins galore. When mixed into a paste with dates and plastered into a pit roasted mutton or goat, an Omani selection of plants provides a taste portfolio that's called Kal al a savory stew, curry-like in flavor that will be very satisfying and even more complex in flavor. So early on in their history, this uh, Semitic and Arabian tribes realized they should not remake one place to resemble another, but rather trade the most unique goods of each to those who lacked them. They made an asset out of one of the inherent weaknesses of their homelands, its unequitable distribution of plant and animal productivity. In doing so, they built an economic model for trade between regions that initially redistributed both wealth and wonder among the inhabitants. It's perhaps somewhat easier to understand, in today's highly interconnected world, the globalized aspects of our economies and societies. The world globalization is on everyone's lips currently. For many of us alive now, it feels like a normal way of existence as we breathe air and walk the earth. Humankind was always a curious animal in the lookout for exchange of ideas. So it shouldn't be improbable to fathom the origins of globalization. The so-called civilized world, once we created the first cities, was always a highly interconnected uh, place. In today's episode, by examining the spice trade through the Arabian Peninsula, we'll find out how this was the reason that triggered an ecological and economic revolution that rippled across the world and has ramifications to this very day. The history of spices is long, messy, confusing and intertwined with uh, many, many other things, of course. And on this episode, it will be fantastically interesting to follow this uh, complex, intertwined path of uh, all the different spices through history and see where it takes us. The first recorded evidence of aromatic plants and products is found in the Egyptian papyri of 2800 BCE and Sumerian tablets of 2200 BCE. The ancient Egyptians seem to have made considerable use of such fragrant plants as marjoram, mint, juniper, styrax, of gum resins such as uh, terebinth, or frankincense, myrrh, iber, and so on. And of spices as we would understand them today such as cinnamon and cassia, almost all these substances reserved for the pharaoh, the princes and the priests, and they supposedly had therapeutic, cosmetic and above all ritual uses. It is not easy to draw clear dividing lines. They were made under the supervision of the priests, but we know very little about their dietary use except that they were often thought to purify food offered to gods. Garlic and onions were the only flavorings the common people had in their diet. Aromatics and precious ointments, of course, were also used in the embalming of persons of high rank. Towards 950 BCE, when the Queen of Sheba visited Solomon, she came with a very great company and camels that bear spices, and of spices great abundance and precious stones. These aromatics would have perfumed the burnt offerings made by the priest king and camels also brought him algum trees, probably sandalwood, 
of which he made terraces to the house of the Lord and to the king's palace. Sandalwood was to remain a perfume and never had any culinary use. The inscriptions in the temple of Deir el-Bahari commemorate the famous expedition of the woman pharaoh Hatshepsut in 1515 BCE and the foods she caused to be brought back. Much later on, from Hatshepsut, Alexandria was a great spice trading center before it became the intellectual capital of the world. The Phoenicians distributed spices across the Mediterranean and even sailed around Spain to take them up to the Atlantic shores, where they exchanged them for tin or amber. They could take an additional cargo of salt on board and offload it on their way, for spices were valuable merchandise but not heavy. Ships carrying them were light and had space aboard to spare. Other Western Europeans took the same goods to more northerly countries by land. Okay, folks, and this is the end of part one. Uh, please stay tuned uh, next week for part two and the week after for part three. Thank you for listening. I would like to thank my voice actors, Mark Knight, Jim Bryden, Baron Anastis, and Rachel Louise Miller. I've been Thomas Dinas, and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Thank you for listening, and see you again soon for the next episode. If you liked today's episode, please go to Patreon and type uh, the Delicious Legacy podcast and um, contribute something to help me do more episodes in the future.